Okay, good evening. It appears that we are now um, going live to Facebook. I don't know. Um, I think we are rolling now. And so we are going to begin sharing the uh, Bible study that was scheduled for tonight. Uh, thank you all, all for being here and for your willingness to participate. I thank the Lord um, that uh, we have this opportunity to be together in a virtual way. And so I'm going to begin with prayer and then we will go from there. Father, tonight, as we enter into this time of Bible study, I pray that you would bless your people wherever they are. And thank you, Father, for your word and for how it comforts and cheers and ministers to us in amazing ways. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so tonight I wanted to share with you um, a study based on the um, based on the Psalm uh, twenty-seven, and this is. I, I'm sure I have preached on this before, and I don't apologize for preaching on it again. It's a really great and important psalm. And especially, it is a reminder to me of my salvation. So, tw uh, 36 years ago, it was... Um, I had received a study Bible, my first study Bible, from my parents for my eighth birthday, which was a little over a week ago. And I remember not, not sure where exactly to start. And so I started with um, then my, the, one of my memorized verses, which was Psalm 23. And I remember, you know, reading Psalm 23 and then the next day deciding to read Psalm 24. And the Lord had been working. There was many details um, about, and looking back, you can kind of see all the different avenues that the Lord was using in working in, in bringing me to himself. But... By next that next week, I got to Psalm 27, and my favorite verse there is verse 8, and that's uh, one of the key verses, I think, of the psalm, verse 8, when the Lord, um, when you said, seek ye my face, my heart said, thy face, Lord, will I seek. And so you have this beautiful um, expression of togetherness, of fellowship. And whenever I read that verse, it was just an instantaneous reaction, right? Um, I was saying it, it was like I was saying it with the psalmist. My heart said, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. And so um, I, I know for sure at that point that I had heard preaching on that psalm before. My, my uncle, Michael, who was the pastor of the church, had been preaching through the psalms for some time. And so uh, I know that the, the, the preaching came back to my memory as I was reading it for myself, right? But there was that moment, right? Um, my grandfather on my on my mom's side, 
my grandpa Beringer, um, he expressed his conversion in a, in a, such a beautiful way. Whenever he said um, he had, they were had been going to a little um, summer revival there at the Baptist Church in Alta Loma, Texas, and he said that night after church, as he was walking across the parking lot, the Lord came to him and said, "I'm yours, and you're mine." And that simple expression of relationship is um, I can definitely relate to. And um, I, it resonates in my heart, and I trust that it will in your heart as well tonight. So if you would turn with me to Psalm 27. Um, I was going back and reading um, back in the 1800s, there were several attempts to translate the Psalms in poetic form, right? In, in meter and rhyme, just like we, we like our English poetry. And um, the, that's very interesting. I'm going to read you one selection here, but then I'm going to read uh, the text after that. So here's uh, the way one psalmist or one translator translated it. God is my strength. The Lord is ever near. His arm protects me. Whom then shall I fear? When wicked men, my foes, their arts employed, to take my life, they fell and were destroyed. Nor should their hate again my peace assail. At sight of danger, shall my courage fail? Though armed hosts should cover all the plain, my faith in God unshaken shall remain. Verse 4. One only object doth engage my care, nor will I cease for this to urge my prayer. Within God's house to dwell is my desire. There learn His will, His excellence admire. Verse 5. His servant there from danger shall he hide. Conceal me there in safety to abide. Verse 6. Until the day when he shall power bestow and lift my head on high above the foe. Then shall my lips the song of triumph raise and pay the grateful tribute of my praise. Verse 7. God, hear my prayer. Give ear unto my cry and comfort in my sore distress supply. Verse 8, Seek ye the Lord in need, thy voice hath said. My heart hath answered, I will seek his aid. 9, Let not thine eye for sorrow turn aside, nor yet thy countenance in anger hide. O put not him away whom thou hast known in former days, and chosen for thine own. 10. When they who gave me birth my soul forsake, the Lord his servant to his care will take. 11. Teach me, good Lord, the way that I should go. Point out the path and guard me from the foe. 11. Uh, 12. Preserve my feet from them that would ensnare, my life from him whose lips will falsely swear. 13. Long since in my distress my strength had failed, had not my faith in thy support prevailed, had not a cheering hope my heart consoled, thy face among the living to behold. And verse 14, My soul, I said, the Lord doth hear thy cry, his hand shall raise thee up, on him rely. So it's a beautiful example of uh, 18 hundreds um, poetry, you know, that romantic era in English poetry that brought about that, but it's also um, a really neat rendition of the psalm. And so let's read it uh, together. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked even mine enemies and my foes came upon me to eat up my flesh. They stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, 
my heart shall not fear. The war should rise against me. In this will I be confident. I have what I call an outline of the psalm. I'm not sure that it's the best outline, but I have it divided up into five sections. Verse 1 through 3 is facing fear. Verse 4 through 6 is fellowship. Verse 7 through 12 is requests and desires. Verse 13 is an observation. And verse 14 is concluding advice. And we'll take these um, a little bit at a time. So first of all, facing fear, verse 1 through 3. Here, the psalmist is expressing his confidence. He says, The Lord is the light, my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? We notice that in this particular psalm, he uses the, the name of the Lord over and over again. The Lord is... Um, it seems to me um, there's one exception in verse 9 where it says the God of my salvation. But every other instance in which um, God is addressed, he's addressed as Lord. And so in this psalm, the lordship of God is the basis or the beginning of the basis for his confidence. His status um, of in control affects not only me and my circumstances, or not only me and my personal relationship to him, but it also affects my circumstances and every other person that comes in contact with me. The, his lordship in other words, is not only limited to me as I submit to his lordship, but remember his lordship extends to everything. It's not we're going to make him lord, even though that is in a sense true and we learn obedience by the things that we suffer, just as Christ learned obedience by the things that he suffered during his um, tenure here on, the, on this earth. But he already is, in title and in reality, Lord. And so our acknowledgement of that is very important. And remember, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. The second point we see is... Uh, the fellowship. The fellowship. There are the grounds of fellowship, first of all. So I divided up this second point into two subpoints. First of all, the grounds of fellowship. In verse 4, he says, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after. The grounds of fellowship. And to borrow a phrase from uh, the old theologians, we find that the psalmist has holy affections. He has holy affections. He expresses his affections in terms of desire. This is really uh, interesting to me. How does, what is the nature of our motivation? And this is one of the things that has, I guess, has um, affected me more than any other consideration as a Christian is how does our motivation, our desires, our thinking, our wanting, 
our you know our kind of get up and go itness interact with what we actually get accomplished for the Lord in our lifetime? How does our motivation connect with our action? And also, how does the Lord perceive both our motivation and our action? How does the Lord interact with us both on the motivation level and on the action level? Love is a holy affection. It is obviously, and I believe it, an affection does not, isn't worth much if there is not follow through an action. But there is definitely a, an emotional component to our relationship with the Lord. Um, Jonathan Edwards, the, the great American theologian, um, wrote his, his book, you know, on religious affections. And he talks about how much the Bible uses emotional terminology. Rejoicing, gladness, happiness, desire. And this is even apart from the, um, the you know, walking or fighting or praying or preaching or the other kinds of... Um, active kinds of uh, activities or what we think of Christian activities that are definitely part of the Christian walk. God himself even is pleased to express his relationship with us in terms of emotions. He expresses um, his love and his desire for us. His um, pursuing of us, his disappointment and brokenheartedness um, w on love rejected, and his joy and gladness on, re on fellowship and relationship restored. I mean, we could go to Luke 15 and the Lord, one of the key sets of parables there that the Lord um, shared with us during his ministry, you have um, what was the emotional response to the finding of the coin, the finding of the lost sheep, and especially the finding of the lost son. It was joy. There is joy in the presence of the angels over one sinner that repents. And so there's a, a definite um, overtone in this particular psalm of the human affections and the emotions that connect us and form the grounds uh, or part of the grounds of our relationship. Notice here that this desire is expressed in, through a modal verb, a, a helping verb. He says there in verse 4, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may. He uses that word may. This is a hope, a wish, a desire that he expresses. And what are the three things that he desires? Number one, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To dwell in the house of the Lord. Now, picture who this is. This is David writing. I believe... Um, And uh, I, I'm not sure on this, so don't quote me, but it, it seems to me that this psalm does follow Psalm 24 and even First Corinthians, uh, First Chronicles 16. So this is a psalm that was written after 
the bringing of the ta- of the Ark of the Covenant up to Mount Moriah, just outside of the Mount Zion, right? Where David's home was and where he established a place that would that would later be the site of the new temple. So, um, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But picture, um, as a result of him bringing up the tabernacle, uh, the the Ark of the Covenant, to to the city of Jerusalem, is an expression of his desire to dwell in the presence of the Lord, in the house of the Lord. The second one, he says, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Number two, that I may behold the beauty of the Lord. These are kind of a result of dwelling in the house of the Lord. They're like the second step. And then number three, that I may, or in order to, inquire in his temple. To have access for wisdom and knowledge and guidance in his temple. And whenever I think of the house of the Lord and the beauty of the Lord and his temple, you know, obviously I'm not thinking of a physical building, even though I love the fact that in our, you know, in our days we have had the opportunities to have buildings and we've, you know, most churches have built buildings and been able to fellowship together in um, a physical place and hopefully that will return soon. But it wasn't just a physical um, location. And we're going to explore that a little bit in, as we go through this. Verse 5 says, In the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. And now shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto him. So part A under number two was the grounds of fellowship. And part B under number two is the goal of fellowship. The goal of fellowship. He talks about being hidden in a pavilion. This is, uh, this is battlefield language. Okay, this is a general who lives in encampment in the fields, and um, they're dug in. Right, they have the the earthworks built up around them, and they're preparing for battle. And in this dug-in location, that's the pavilion, right? That's a pavilion was a, was an, was a military encampment. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me, and he will set me up upon a rock. If you are fixing to go into battle, where do you want to be? You want to be, you want to hold that high ground, right? You want to be on that rock, on that, um, it's an impregnable place. Um, It's not um, easily accessible from the enemy. He says, my head shall be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. From that vantage point, you have more torque. You have more um, impetus for your attacks. Um, But is he talking about is he actually talking about a physical location? Is he talking about a physical encampment here? And it seems um, fairly obvious to me that he's using this as a metaphor to his relationship with the Lord. A relationship that is not necessarily limited to a physical location. Right? When we think of hiding in the Lord's pavilion, 
we're talking about the ability to to quiet ourselves in communion with the Lord in his presence right wherever that may be in your in your prayer closet um, in your bedroom in your living room reading the scriptures or even in your workplace in you know, whatever situation you find yourself in David was a man of action he was a man of war and so even there the eve of a battle on the battlefield in the midst of a charge from that high point the Lord hide him the Lord keep him the Lord secret him in his hiding place and the Lord preserve him and what will the result be therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy I will sing yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord this um, expression of praise this expression of worship right and again this expression of worship um, it was actually quoted in um, in Hebrews chapter 13 mm, the the fruit of our lips right the sacrifices of joy these are a different kind of sacrifice from the sacrifice of lambs and goats and turtle doves right these are expressions and um, I think you can get that picture of David dancing before the Ark of the Covenant as it was coming into the city of Jerusalem of his lifting up his voice of his exalting the name of the Lord of his recounting the mighty deeds of the Lord he was offering in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy we know that the tabernacle there that Moses built and the temple that Solomon built and the church buildings that we build are simply um, a a model they are a um, an indication or a um, what do you call it they are a metaphor of our um, eventual tabernacle the Lord in his flesh is the tabernacle right he said you can destroy this temple and in three days I will lift it up so it's the Lord's body itself that is the temple and we know when we get to Revelation chapter 21 he says behold the tabernacle of the Lord is with men what is that talking about it's talking about the Lord coming back right whenever he descends from heaven never more to leave that is the desire and the goal and the expectation that the psalmist is expressing here that is tabernacle that is temple that is church that is worship so that's the first half of the psalm as we move into our third point and looking at the second half I want to examine the psalmist is talking right he's admonishing he's making statements about the Lord the Lord is my light and my salvation he's expressing right he's expressing his confidence of particular things that the Lord is to him but these are his expressions these are his enunciations of joy and uh, confidence and expectation but whenever we consider what is he basing this on is there a word has he gotten a word from the Lord and we find that in in this whole psalm there is one word from the Lord that he builds this whole psalm around let's look there in verse 7 and verse 8 in Psalm 7 he says hear O Lord when I cry with my voice have mercy also upon me and answer me when thou saidest 
Seek ye my face. My heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. So in this psalm, there is one phrase that God said, Thus saith the Lord. And what was that? It, it was, Seek ye my face. So as we consider our religious affections, our um, holy desires, we realize that our religious affections and our holy desires and our motivation are simply a reaction, a reciprocation, a giving back to Him of His initial move towards us, right? He was the first to make a move. We love Him because He first loved us. He sent out a desire. He sent out a command expressed in desire, expressed in um, these four words, Seek ye my face. It tells us, um, um, I can't remember now, right off the top of my head, if it was Hebrews or First Peter, the Lord did not say to his people, Seek ye me in vain. He didn't tell us to seek him so that he could play hide and seek. Right? He didn't, he didn't say, Come find me and I'm going to hide myself. But rather, it's an invitation for us to come to him, for us to seek him. And this invitation is the good news. It's the gospel. It's an invitation to all people. It's an invitation to you tonight and to me. Seek ye my face. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Says in Jeremiah. So... The psalmist here is acknowledging this dialogue back and forth. O Lord, hear me when I cry. Have mercy upon me and answer me. I'm talking to you. You're talking to me. I have heard you talk to me, and that's why I'm talking to you. Right? You said, seek my face, and I said, my heart said, my desires, my emotions, my love, my will, my mind, my intellect, every part of my soul, my, my mind, my heart, my soul, my might, my, my strength is engaged in this. Thy face, Lord, will I seek. It's engaged in fulfilling the first commandment. Love the Lord your God. So we have the dialoguing. Um, we have the engagement there in verse 9 and verse 10. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not. Neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. Another one of those epithets. I love um, noting and connect, collecting the epithets, the, the terms um, that the Lord is known by among his people. This is one of the terms that the Lord is known by, right? God of my salvation. And so in this engagement, he says, don't hide your face. Don't play hide and seek with us. Don't push me away. Don't neglect me. Don't reject me. In fact, he says, when other people have rejected me, when my father and my mother have forsaken me, then the Lord will take me up. He has this confidence in the Lord's good grace and the good pleasure to love and minister to him. And then... Our dependence because of this relationship developing 
this, this give and take, this dialogue, then we walk together, right? We are, we are um, how should we say, we are yoked together with him. We walk in tandem. We pull together. We fight together. We're in harness together. Teach me thy way, O Lord. Lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over to the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. We are dependent on him to walk with us, to take our hands, to accompany us step by step. And so, um, because of this interaction, right, on these three levels, the dialoguing, the engagement, and the dependence, um, then he comes there in verse 13 to an observation. He says, if, if, if it was in, in terms of an option, is my walking with the Lord optional? Is my um, learning to trust the Lord, is that an option? You know, well, I could trust him or I have these other possibilities here you know i'm weighing my options i'm i'm trying to figure out uh what i'm going to do here um i've got this other really cool offer on the table that i haven't made up my mind about no nothing like that right in verse 13 he says i had fainted unless i had believed to see the goodness of the lord in the land of the living there are there is no other option for him there is no other alternative. There is either we have the Lord or else we faint. We pass out. We can't continue. We can't go on. We can't continue. We can't take the next step. But it's the goodness of the Lord that sustains us. It's the goodness of the Lord that allows us to live it talks about in the land of the living. Now that could possibly have a, an allusion to the resurrection, right? To those who are eternally living. But I believe it also has a, a definite application to even this day. This situation to us today who are still alive. He uses actually that um, argument in another place. Um, I believe it was Psalm 93 or 94. But he says, he says the, the graves don't praise you, Lord. Dead bones don't praise you. It's us who are alive that praise you. And so he uses that argument to ask the Lord to preserve him in order for him to be a witness to this present generation. And so in a sense, the Lord is going to preserve many of us at this time through this process, through these circumstances, so that we will be a witness during these days to those who are living today. And as long as we have life and those around us have life, then God has given us an opportunity to look to him and to love him and to walk with him. And so our only option is to believe and then as a result to see the goodness of the Lord, to see his hand, to see his grace poured out upon us, both in this life, in our daily work, in our daily walk, in our jobs, in our homes, and in the circumstances in which we pass. So the ob he's observing that his only option is the Lord. And so that brings us to a hope and a trust. There's a certain expectation, verse 14. Wait on the Lord. Is he talking to himself? Is he talking to us, his audience? Yes, probably both, right? He is in both encouraging himself, wait, be patient. Go through 
the process of turning it over to him and letting him handle the details. Wait on the Lord. There were times in, when jo, uh, Jehoshaphat, um, the son of David, a king of Israel, was told to go forth to battle and then was ordered not to lift up his sword and not fight. He said, no. He said, in this case, you're going to stop and you're going to stare. He says, those are your only two orders. Stop and stare. Play music. Sing. Shout. Rejoice. Have the, um, have the Levites come out with the choir. Bring out the bring out the, the um, orchestra, bring all the instruments, play music, and then watch what God does. And in our circ- uh, present circumstances, in, in many ways, um, we are limited to the kind of action that we can take, right? But one thing we can do, and that is wait. And we are encouraged, and we are... Um, motivated to wait because in this case we have an a certain and a trustful expectation he says be of good courage the lord shall strengthen your heart now wow that is amazing that the lord will strengthen our heart what is he talking about our emotions our desires our will through our waiting, our desires and our motivation becomes purified as He becomes the soul and the center of our hopes and our thoughts and our expectations. As we stake all that we have upon Him and He takes our, um, this, these expectations of ours and He begins to strengthen um, one of the favorite, my favorite um, quotes from C.S. Lewis, he's talking about um, fleshly desires and fleshly temptations. And he says the problem isn't that the flesh is strong or that our desires are too strong and they overcome us in temptation. He says, no, the problem is our desires are too weak. If we had stronger desires, if... if um, if we had purer desires, if we had loftier desires, they would burn away as dross, these puny, earthly, human desires. And that's what he is expecting here, and he is encouraging us. The Lord will strengthen our heart through this process of waiting. And so he reiterates and he reemphasizes, wait, I say, on the Lord. And with that, let's close. Dear Heavenly Father, you're reaching out to us in prayer, in love and in grace is amazing. We stand in awe at your invitation. And as best we can, we want to reciprocate and we want to say, yes, Lord, Thy face will I seek. And yes, Lord, my heart responds. And yes, Lord, I love you because you first loved me. Strengthen our hearts, we pray, tonight and through these days, in your word, in Jesus' name, amen. Good evening, and trust that each one of y'all are well. Um, Our prayer requests are... Um, offline, they're shared among uh, Sunday schools. And so um, y'all get in touch with your Sunday school prayer group and prayer chain. And, uh, or, we, or we could um, text them to you or something like that. And we're going to pray um, for those and keep those in mind. The Lord bless you tonight and goodbye.